So, uh, Tributaries of Eden, Parshas <laughs> Vayetze. Uh, the, what we've been talking about over the last few weeks is to try to show how the Torah is so rich that in those same words, which can be read on such a simple level, just to understand the story, but there's layer after layer after layer, all these different layers within the Parsha that, that we can find by looking a little bit closer. And I think, as, as uh, Jeff was saying, that, that, that we can really appreciate this when it comes to something in the Parsha which is already open to interpretation, something that, that doesn't really have a simple story behind it. It's all something esoteric or difficult to understand. And by that I mean Yaakov's dream. Let's uh, look in the Chumash on page uh, 145. And you see, Yaakov goes to sleep and he dreams. He dreams there is a ladder based in the ground. The top of the ladder reaches towards the heavens. And the angels of God are ascending and descending on that ladder. And behold, Hashem is standing over him and he tells him. Now the, the prophecy that he receives is a very important one. It is the one where Yaakov finally hears from Hashem that you are the one who I am giving the role after Avraham and Yitzchak to be the next um, uh, uh, link in that chain. And I'm going to give you the land and you will spread in all directions and you will get the blessings of all the, um, of all the world. And I will be with you, and I will guard you, and don't worry, you will get everything that I have promised you, and Yaakov wakes up. So the prophecy is the prophecy. But not always do we have when Hashem speaks to Avraham or to Yitzchak or to anyone else, that there is some image or vision which precedes that prophecy. And the question is, what is the latter, what does it represent, what does it mean, and here just, there is no simple meaning, it's a dream, it's a vision, it's a prophecy, so it's without needing any major, it's obviously going to have all these different meanings. So what's the, what's the simplest meaning? So if you look in Rashi, Rashi is actually not on that verse, but afterwards, when Yaakov awakens, and he, Yaakov himself, interprets the dream. So if you take a look, right there, in verse 17, Yaakov became afraid. And he said, how awesome is this place? This is, this is the house of God. And this is the gate to heaven. So Yaakov is interpreting the dream for us. How is he interpreting the dream? So Rashi there says, V'zeh shar shemayim, this is the gate of heaven. Makom tefillah, this is the place of prayer. Lalos tefillah sam ha for prayers to go upwards, towards heaven. There is no gate to heaven, there's no gateway, there's no doorway in the physical sense. The stairway to heaven. Right? That's, that's, yes. good. that's yeah. good. Uh, uh, but th there's no there's no gate, so it's got to be some spiritual entrance or portal for what? For prayer. Zeshar Shemayim. This is the gate to for things. That's what Rashi is reading into this. And then Rashi quotes. Rashi says Umidrasho. The Madrash seems to suggest. That there is the upper holy temple and there's the lower holy temple and they are one above the other and so that's why it's the gateway to heaven because it allows, we'll talk about it more soon, but it allows the transport of the spiritual accomplishments of the Jewish people, specifically Rashi's focus on prayer, to go up. So where did prayer come from all of a sudden? He was just having a dream. It's like he, he didn't 
Well, it says Vayifka Bamakom that he daven Ma'ariv, but still, at this point, he's not davening. Maybe we'll come back to that question, but let's start with an earlier question, which is why is he being shown this? Why is he seeing this? Why is it important that we know that he saw a ladder? Do we need Yaakov to tell us? Isn't that what we do? We pray towards Yerushalayim every time we pray. And what are the angels? Are you going to say these are the angels carrying the prayers or the angels are our prayers? Yaakov didn't, didn't give us enough information on that. He just says, well, this is Beis Elohim, Bezeh Shara Shemaim, that's all he gives us. So what are we supposed to learn from that? What, what, are we, what are we trying to learn from the fact that Yaakov realizes that this is the Shara Shemaim, this is the gateway to heaven? <coughs> so one explanation that's given, and I think it's a fair one, is that Yaakov doesn't dream this because Yaakov doesn't dream this vision in order to teach him something different. He has this vision because that's actually what's happening in that place. Yeah, he's not getting a message of some um, prophecy, of something for him to learn, his vision was actually a perspective about the place. He wasn't seeing something in a dream that his imagination was telling him. He was actually wearing those special glasses, so to speak, to see the invisible ink, to see what's happening there all the time. And right now, there's a ladder going from the land to the heavens in that place, which if we could see, we would see the prayers ascending and descending. But there are other places where the word chalom in the Shorish is, is not used, and it can be interpreted toward a prophetic vision. And here specifically, like uh, by Yosef, chalom is used to designate the symbolism right. of some sort. Right, but here there are those, and Rashi seems to be joining them, who are not suggesting, as we'll see all the other opinions, that there is a whole message behind it, but simply that he's being shown, you should know how special this place is. Which we then would understand that it's not just for him, but for us. Because the fact is, when the, our forefathers came to Eretz Yisrael, they chose not to live in Yerushalayim. They chose to live in Hebron. And even though the Akedah, God says, go to Haramoria, and here he stops and prays and has this vision at Haramoria, and he tells us that this is Beis Elohim, this is the house of God, which we know means that in the future we're going to build the house of God there. They seem to be avoiding this place. When the Jews arrive in Eretz Yisrael, they do not come here. It is almost a half a millennium later, almost 500 years later, that David purchases the granary of this Jebusite called Aravna, and he's told secretly this is going to be the place in Shlomo. It's almost like we're trying to keep this place a secret, which we do. You know the Torah? You ever notice that the Torah, whenever it talks about the place where the temple is going to stand, it keeps referring to it as the place that I shall choose, mm -hmm. the place that I will be. Even when Hashem speaks to Avram and says, you're going to go to Haram Maria, to one of the mountains that I will show you. Here, it calls it Vayifka Bamakom, and he bumped into the place. It keeps avoiding mentioning it. So Har Hamoriah then is the Temple Mount? Yes. Oh. We call it Harabayas once the temple is built on it, but originally it's Har Hamoriah. That's its that's its real name. <coughs> so, according to this interpretation, this is being told to us so that we recognize that the mountain that Yitzchak was brought on, the place where. Abraham prayed, which Yaakov says, I've got to pray in that same place, the place where he goes to sleep, that's actually more 
than just some random place. It is the Shar HaShemayim. So the message is for us to recognize that it isn't for us just some random place that we chose to build a temple on. This shul, this shul was chosen because it worked out in terms of real estate. But there's nothing about this place that suggests that this building needs to be in this place. So don't misunderstand and think that because there's no mention of Yerushalayim or the mountain anywhere until seemingly David buys some random granary and says, look, we've got this open field, let's build a temple, and the son Shlomo builds it there. The Torah wants to tell us right here that the temple mount is your place, which is integrally a part of you connected to the work and everything that your um, pa- the patriarchs invested into it. And that's why they don't live there. That, well, they don't live there because the place is being avoided mm-hmm. so that it doesn't, it's not revealed mm-hmm. that this is the special place but until we're no ready. Chance, no chance of any desecration of the place either. Right, right. Because we know that um, a lot, there are a lot of people who even today would love to have ownership of the Temple Mount, even though technically for their religion there's no, no spiritual significance of it, but they'll make some up if they need to. Now, I'm just a little confused. Did Yaakov know that it was a special place, just didn't realize how special? Because why would he just lay down and go to sleep if he knew how special the place was. So um, Rashi seems to suggest, at least from the way, again, we're just at the simple reading, yeah. that um, he came to the place, he, he reached the place. The place sounds like it was a place that he knew. And uh, Rashi tells us that Yifka also means that he prayed there. So he came there and, again, I'm putting this in the very simple terms, made camp there because this was a special place. This was where... His, his father and grandfather had been, and so he stopped there and prayed and stayed there for the night, and it was all a procedure. He put these stones around him, and it was, a, it was a holy process. He just, as you said it, he didn't quite realize that this is the place. This is the most important place in the world. And that's what the dream is showing him. So the dream is not so much a prophecy as much as it was, if I can call this, a revelation of uh, what's really going on in the world. And that's what he sees, this ladder. So you're saying he actually picked that place to stay because his forefathers went there, his father. That's what Rashi says. So he knew it Rashi was says that Yeah, Rashi there. says that he originally passed it, and then he said, wait, that was the mountain that my forefathers were, so he went back to it, and the, and the land came towards him. It's a whole complicated thing, but clearly, it's very clear from Rashi, that Rashi argues that he knew and it sounds like it's just from reading the Torah, because it says, Vayifga Bamakom, the place. And he, he met or uh, chanced upon or came upon the place. So it sounds like he, he, was, he realized that it was the place. Except that he says, I didn't know, I didn't realize, that's what I'm saying, he didn't realize that this is Beis Elohim and Zeshar Shemayim. He thought it was a special place, he didn't realize this was the holiest of the holy. That's all seems to be the simple reading of the verse. Okay, so you just mentioned the reason Hashem does not reveal the location. So somebody like the canonize or somebody else come and camp there and make sure that we don't have it. Okay. Mm. Or build a build their own temple on it. Maybe a mosque or something. Yeah. <laughs> but something. How is it is you know what you're just saying, what you're teaching us right now, that Hashem Everybody would, ah, oh, here you go. It's so obvious. But they still didn't know where it was. <laughs> See, even the people who came into Erzsa with the Torah knew that there was a mountain somewhere. That was the Akeda, and it was the Shara Shamayim, and it was the Beis Elohim, and nobody had a clue. It wasn't a big mountain. Nobody, yeah, it wasn't. Actually, it was, the, it was not the tallest mountain in the place, right? We say... And so they didn't know the whole thing was one big mystery that sometime, at some point in the future, someone's going to come and point to it, and then that became David's job. And of course, they, 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 as the Talmud explains, David, when he went to buy that, <coughs> he 
took um, an equal amount of money from all 12 tribes to purchase this piece of land. And that was strange because David had plenty of money of his own, but he insisted that this piece of land be purchased by all 12 tribes, everyone giving an equal amount. Because he knew that in 100 years from now, anyone who gives more money is going to try to claim some kind of ownership. So the whole thing is a setup in order to make sure that the Temple Mount becomes the Temple Mount for all the Jewish people equally, and that previously it should not be desecrated by anyone. So with the patriarchs, because Abraham knew this was such, you know, offering Yitzhak, was a big thing. So the two of them knew where the place was. <coughs> well, when, when Avram is first told, he doesn't. No, I mean, right. after the fact, after... Yeah, actually, at right. the end of the Akedah, you see Avram names the place, right. Hashem so Yira, right? God is seen in this place. So Yitzhak might have told Yaakov exactly where it well, was. Well, we, we assume so, yeah. Right, we, but over right. time, that was forgotten. Well, no, he knows where the place is. No, he comes on it. Over time, well, Yaakov, the, yeah, but the, yeah, with, with well, the Yaakov might have shown it to his sons as well, but you know, uh, you couldn't What's show it. Israel, uh, yeah, what are you going to mean? That there's a place with sand on it. You know, that's uh, it didn't have any identifying markers. Uh, so okay. yeah, I, I imagine that uh, even in e Egypt, where the Jews were sharing stories with each other, right. they would have known that there was a special place. And throughout the Torah, it keeps talking about that there is a special place. They just didn't know where it was. They didn't market it anyway. Right. But at least they know, they have information about it, yeah. that it's the Beis Elohim and the Shara HaShemayim. <coughs> yeah, I would think that would be something they would pass, the type of thing you'd pass on in stories from one parent right. to another. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Before you have the Pesach story, you've got That's the it. previous story. Right. However, let's add to this. Now, in terms of the angels, so what are the angels? So Rashi explains, and we're not going to read all the Rashi's inside, but Rashi explains that, again, Rashi's reading that this isn't a prophecy with information of, of ir irrelevant to the subject. Yaakov's just seeing the truth. So says Rashi, because there are actually angels going up and down. We have the famous question that says, The angels are going up and down. And as we know, angels who live in heaven should be going down and then up. So Rashi explains that what Yaakov is seeing is the actual angels. He's watching as the angels who have been protecting him while he's been living in Israel are making their ascent, and we have different angels when we leave Israel and we go to Chutzlarz, and those angels were coming down. So first, Malachi Elohim Olim, those are the Israeli angels, and then the um, Chul <laughs> angels are on their way down. That's all Rashi, according to his interpretation, that Yaakov isn't seeing a prophecy of some kind. He's simply being shown the reality of what's going on in the deeper realm. All of that is Rashi. Comes along the Midrash. The Midrash offers a number of explanations, and we're going to look at them because all of them are going to be true because it's a prophecy, and it's a vision. And visions are never just one layer. Without, I, I'm saying, usually we have the simple reading, then you have the Midrash, then you have the secret, then you have, but in a, in a, in a, in a prophecy, it's all, it's all the simple understanding, because it's all interpretation. Says the Midrash, Behine Sulam, there's a ladder, Zehakevesh, that's the ramp. Mutzav Arza, sitting on the ground or based on the ground. Zemizbeach, that's the altar. Rosho Magia Hashemaima, and the top of the ladder, reaching heavenward. Elu HaKarbonos, that's the offerings. Shereichan Olu Lashamayim, whose pleasant aroma would ascend heavenward. Elohim, the angels of God, Elu Kohanim Gedolim, are all the Kohanim. Interesting, interesting. It's still not a prophecy, even though it is a prophecy. It's still a perspective or a vision of what's going on in this place, but of the future. 
So Yaakov is being shown that this is the Temple Mount. And the ladder is the ramp based on the ground. That's the altar. And Yaakov is watching, on some level, the performance of the service in the Temple. Beautiful, beautiful interpretation by the Midrash. But why? Why? Why would Yaakov be shown this, of all things? Why is this important for where he's going and what he's... So you could say simply, because he's, like we just said, being shown the significance of the place. But the significance of the place would just be to see the temple. Why is he being shown according to this Midrash, why is he being shown the process of the service in the temple and the Kohanim? Could it have something to do with the fact that he also had that promise from Hashem that of, of what's going to happen with the Jewish people and that that was an integral part of what would be the Jewish people in the land? Well, yes, we're, we're going to come back to that. I'll, I'll just start us off, even though we're not really going to get into this. But uh, yeah, yeah, uh, when Avraham is told by God, when you're going to inherit this land, he says to God, Bama eda, with, how, how do I know that that's really going to happen? So God says to him, take a calf and a ram and a goat and a sheep, basically all the animals which can be brought as sacrifices and to lay them out and cut them up in the whole process. And the Gemara understands that Avram is being told that the truth is that the Jewish people will only merit this land because of the performance which they will do of all the service in the Beis HaMikdash. So, yeah, we'll see, we'll come back to that soon. So it is possible to suggest that Yaakov is being given a, a reiteration of the information that Avram was given during his vision. But we'll come back to that because there's actually greater parallels between these two visions. But if you're saying that the only reason that the Jewish people will get the base of Megdash is because, I mean, or get the land of Israel is because they're meriting through the service in the base of Megdash, but there was, you have to have the land before you have the base of Megdash. Well, it's interesting because they have the base of Megdash because they have the Mishkan. So, so the, 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 tech, the, the Mishkan already begins the process, and for the first 500 years, they just have a Mishkan. And then the time comes, and Shlomo builds the temple, and then it becomes the, so the, the base of Mishkan. the Mishkan is what allowed them to... The offering of sacrifices, which today would be our prayers, but the offering of sacrifices is considered, according to these Midrashim, as the greatest merit that the Jewish people have in terms of having the rights to the land. It seems awfully strange to me since sacrifices were used by the pagan, by the people who were doing about Zara, that that was yeah, the, land, we're, yeah. the land. I mean, that's I mean, what people did. It's not like, wow, you did something so great. You did just what everybody else is doing, except you do it to your God and we're doing it to our gods. You know, like... Um. I don't know, that's an interesting perspective. I, I don't know if I'm bothered by the fact that they do it. The question is, why, why is it such a big deal? Is yes. that what you're asking? Yes. Well, it really is a big deal because you, got, you have to, as a people, maintain this process. And it's a very complicated process. And maintaining it for the sake of heaven and being focused on that, that's, that's a big deal. And we just, we're not in touch with it because we don't have it today. <laughs> But the fact that the pagans did it, the pagans got it from uh, you know, the ancient t traditions that go back to Cain and Hevel. It's a positive thing which can be used for the negative. Right? They, they bow to their gods, we bow to God too. I'm not, I, don't think, I think everyone gets that. It's just a way of uh, serving God. So offerings rather than sacrifices, because they're not really sacrifices. God doesn't need meat or... Um, smoke coming up from the... But this, the concept of an offering, that is something that the Torah spends a whole book on. So clearly it's what the Torah wants. Can the tie-in uh, with the Kohanim going up and down have anything to do with the end of the Pesach with the master and the, and the promise to, uh, to do the tithing? Interesting, interesting. It, almost like he's being taking that as a hint to follow that, maybe, yeah. Why not? I mean, that, that sounds like a, that's, where, that's what would have prompted that. I, yeah, I, it's fair. So. Okay. You just mentioned that Abraham and Yaakov, they had this visionary 
dreams? Did Esau have the same one too? Uh, I wouldn't think so. At what point would he have had this? <coughs> Is it because Esau has a, such a complete faith that he didn't need a reassurance? Esau? Esau. Oh, Yitzchak. I'm Yitzchak. sorry, I didn't hear you. Oh, I did, he, did Yitzchak have this dream? Um, <laughs> did Yitzchak have this dream? We don't really have Yitzchak having a dream. But Yitzchak is a different personality. So he gets, he gets this information in his own way. Like He has the prophecy. Hashem comes to him and says, I'm, you're going to get the land and, and all of that. But he doesn't... Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that Yitzchak needs this type of... Uh, these visuals because of who he is and the way that he perceives things. Right, because you had a more of a bitophon than... Right. What more could you need than being... A Cater, right? Well, right, he himself was an offering, right? right. <laughs> That's about the biggest message you could ever have, right? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Step three. Oh, oh, I go on. Kind of, I, I think I remember also, like, when it talks about lechem l'chol v'ni v'lobosh, that the, that could also be allu an allusion to the lechem hapanim and, and, the, and to the big day. The, well, uh, okay. I, yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, Yaakov, that, that would definitely work better with what uh, Mr. Kotler is saying, that that uh, Yaakov is prompted by this, by this vision, to try to, what's the right word, connect to or draw down the process of the Beis HaMikdash. So yeah, the, the bread being eaten and the clothing being worn, which would be um, the vestments of the Kohanim. Absolutely. I think that all works within level two of what this vision that Yaakov is being shown. Yeah, I guess I was going to ask that that would have to be a, a deeper, because if I'm reading this correctly on the surface, it almost seems like Yaakov is making it very conditional that he'll set up um, a, a pillar there to be for the house of God if God gives some bread to eat and clothes to wear. And right, right. That whole condition thing requires a whole uh, discussion yeah. on, on itself. Absolutely. Yeah. So I don't know if it would tie so much into that, meaning you're saying, well, if you do give me a base, I make the then I'd like to be this kind of conduit well, for that. Well, it was that. kind of like he was going to set up the pillar. Am I reading this wrong? It sounds like... No, no, he does. It does. Absolutely. The commentaries give a lot of discussion on Yaakov's seeming, well, let's make a deal after he just got a promise from God. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Level three. Next line in the Midrash. Vayachlom, and he dreamt v'hine sulam, a ladder, ze Sinai. He's being shown Sinai. Mutsav Arza. Mutsav is an interesting word. Mutsav means like standing. You know where else we have the word Mutsav? Vayisyatsavu betachti sahar. The Torah uses that same word Mutsav. Vayisyatsavu beneath the mountain. The Jewish people stood there. Verosho magi ashmaimu. All the top reaches into heaven, which is the flame of fire rising all the way to the heart of heaven, as the pasuk says. Boer baesh ad leiv hashamayim. It uses that term that the whole Sinai image was based on the ground reaching heavenward. And the midrash adds that sulam. If you look in this parsha, the word sulam is spelled samach lamed mem. It's missing a vav. Mm -hmm. Sulam, Samach Lamad Mem, not Sulamani. Mm -hmm. so, um, Samach Lamad Mem is 60, 30, 40, which is 130. As we discussed last week, that's the 130. But the word Sinai, Samach Yud Nun Yud, 60, 10, 50, 10, is also 130. So the sulam is spelled without a vav, so that it has the same numerical value as Sinai. What's the, What's the translation of that again? Because he's actually seeing the giving of the Torah. Uh, okay. he's, he's being shown a metaphor, he's seeing it in the form of a ladder, but he's being shown the process of the giving of the Torah. V'hine malach elokim continues the medrash, the angels of God going up and down, zem Moshe ve'aron. As it says, Moshe Allah El Elokim, and Vayered Moshe, and that makes perfect sense why the Torah talks about the angels going up mm -hmm. and then going down, 
because they're actually humans who show up in Yaakov's dream looking like angels. But no, if I would see Moshe and Aaron, I'd probably think they're angels too. They were about as close as it gets. Yaakov is being shown the giving of the Torah at Sinai. Now, why is he being shown this here? So then you'd have to say, and a whole new explanation, that Yaakov is being given his mission card. Mm -hmm. Yaakov is being told, right now, I'm going to show you the end image that you're going to start working on. What we want is 600,000 families, 2 to 3 million people, standing around the mountain, and Moshe and Aaron, that's the end goal. Get working on it. Mission impossible. You're too young to yeah. No, no, your mission if you should choose to accept it. Right. But, is, it, is it the reason uh, Jacob was so harsh on Levi, his son? Because he knew he was the grandfather of Moshe and Aaron? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Maybe. Maybe Yaakov already knows, right? Yaakov's being shown this vision, and uh, you know, he's got to, his, his whole life would, be, would revolve around planning for this event. Now, does that mean that he knows that Sinai is in the Sinai Peninsula, and he understands that there's going to be Egypt, and therefore he then maybe allows everything that happens to happen and plays along with all that happens because he knows all this needs to happen? Who knows? Who knows? Because Yaakov is given secret information that no, no one else had, which is he's being shown a glimpse, just a glimpse, of about, say, 280 years in the future when the Jews would stand at Har Sinai. And how clear do you think this all is coming with the time? A lot of times a, a vision is not so clear. It's like they talk about Moses. Well, he's a prophet, so we would assume it, and if the Midrash is taking it this way. That means the Midrash understood, I mean, this is this opinion in the Midrash, that uh, Yaakov understood that he was seeing a metaphor for what the Sinai experience was. So, do you, does he retain that, and is that what, part of what he loses when he goes to bless his sons? Interesting, because he, there he loses the uh, knowledge of the end of days. Yeah which is a little different than the yeah. knowledge of the end of the Egyptian process, mm -hmm. unless that was the secret that he was going to reveal to them, was when the Jews were actually going to leave Egypt. Maybe. Maybe. That, that's or an interesting interpretation. Part, you know, right. Um, that, that's very possible. Very possible that, uh, that, that Yaakov is being shown the end here, although we'll get to level four, and we'll see that he might be shown the future as well even further than that in this, in this same vision. But at least now where he's being shown Sinai, without question, Yaakov is then going to be working on achieving this. And I don't know if we'll have time to get to this, but we'll talk about how all the things that Yaakov is doing while he is away is all part of the process of creating the Jewish people. We talked a little bit about the 600,000 sheep and the, and the souls and all that. That's going to be connected to Yaakov's knowledge <laughs> of that he needs to bring these people to, to the mountain, eventually. Alright, that's level three. Level four. From the Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer. You've all heard this Midrash before. The angels of God are ascending and descending upon the ladder, says the Pirkei de Rebeliezer, which is a much older midrash than the midrash. The Pirkei de Rebeliezer, parts of it are older than the Talmud. So this is an old midrash. This is what it says. God showed him four kingdoms, Rising and falling. And notice that the word malchios, which is kingdoms, is very much related to the word malachim, angels. And in fact, as we know, that the kingdoms are really powered by the angel above in heaven who's in charge of running the spiritual realm, as we've discussed in previous classes. So he watches, this is from the Midrash, Sar Malchus Bavel, 
the minister, the angel of the kingdom of Babylon, O Shivim Ukim Vyored, rise seventy rungs and fall. Veher Ahu Sar Malchus Madai, and he saw the median king or minister. O Lechamishim Ushnaim Ukim rise fifty two rungs, Vyored and fall. Veherahu then he saw Sar Malchus Yavan, the angel of the Greeks. Ola Mea Ushmona Ukim rise one hundred and eighty rungs, Vyored and fall. Veherahu Sar Malchus Edom, and then he watches the angel of the kingdom of Edom of Rome rise. Ola Veeno Yored, but he wasn't coming down. A hundred rungs, two hundred rungs, three hundred rungs. He's out of vision already. Five hundred so rungs. Even then, they knew it wouldn't end. Even so many centuries ago. Right. Well, when was Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer? So Rabbi Eliezer is right before. Um, he was he was after the Romans had taken power, but right before the destruction of the temple. Of the first temple. Yeah, of the second temple. Oh. So he's. Meaning the Romans already basically own Eretz Yisrael. They've captured the world by then. But they have yet um, to destroy the temple. And Rabbi Eliezer, you know the story of Rabbi Yochanan and Zakkai who goes out to talk to Vespasian. So the two students who <coughs> carried the coffin, because they were the only two who knew that he was really alive, um, one of them is Rabbi Eliezer. And Pirkei of Lezer is basically, we don't have exact, because he didn't write all of it, some of it is later, but the basic text was written by him, so that means that already when Rome is barely a century or two old, he's already declaring that the um, Roman exile, or the kingdom of Rome, which continues on to this day, would last beyond what, uh, what um, human perception can, can see in terms of the rungs of a ladder. Amar lo Yaakov. So Yaakov then says to this angel, he says, no, eventually you shall fall. And Hashem says to him, etc. And Yaakov wakes up in fear. Manora hamakam He says the fear was because he watched this dream describing the fourth very scary exile. Fascinating take on the Midrash. Midrash is understanding that these ministers, by the way, it's interesting, I, I find this fascinating, there's a whole debate about the length of the, you know, there's a missing 150 years in Jewish history, mm-hmm. if everyone's familiar with it. There's 150 years that have gone missing. Um, they're very difficult to account for. And the reason why the world claims that there's 150 years missing is because we have, in our histories, and with the Talmudic version of history, only has four Persian kings. When in fact, world history has 14 Persian kings. And this is a problem, because the way the world measures a time, which is a little bit unclear even to them as well, but certainly it seems like the rabbis um, lost some time there. So the truth is, I, sh- I should just point this out, because this Midrash is a fascinating take on this, because this Midrash is written by Rabbi Eliezer not too long, not too long, not too far away, a couple of hundred years after, after the end of the Persian Empire. Everyone would have known at that point the length of the Persian Empire. But if you did study Persian history, you know that their kingdom really only lasted four kings. There was Cyrus, the founder of the, there, there was his son Cambyses, and then there was Darius, and then there was, what? There was the son of Esther. Well, Xerxes seems to be um, um, Ahasuerus, according to some. <laughs> and and Xerxes is the one who leads a campaign into Greece right. and loses. Right. right. That's the War of Marathon, and... Uh, all the, the, all from Herodotus, they actually lose that war, and some point to that, 
as the end of the true Persian Empire, because at that point it was a struggle between Greece and Persia, and over the next 150 years or so, until Alexander comes along, or 200 years, until Alexander comes along, there is a Persian and a Greek Empire, but the Persians are no longer the empire. So it, it's interesting that the Medrash here attributes only 52 years to Persia, because here we're talking about the length of when they run the world, so you still have an issue of the timing, because the timing doesn't seem to match up. But it's certainly not a problem that the rabbis only attribute four kings to Persia, because the true Persian Empire, which was started by Cyrus, expanding and taking over, when the Greeks come back, the Athenians, and push back to Persia, and say to them, well, you've got your kingdom, we're going to start building ours before Alexander comes and combines it all into his, it really is only four kings. Back to, back to our subject. Um, the Baal HaTurim is a fascinating work on the Torah. I, I should explain why. Um, Rabbi Yaakov Baal HaTurim was one of the foremost halachists that the Jewish people ever had. He invented a whole system for organizing halacha. It used to be, up until a thousand years ago, if you wanted to know the halacha for something, there was only one book to look in, and that was the Talmud. But anyone who's attempted to look at the Talmud, and it's 3,000 pages, almost 3,000 pages, you know that to try to derive the final thought and the halachic ruling within the Talmud is impossible. Now, of course, you can look at all the commentaries, and you'll see this commentary says this, that commentary says that, But we needed something that could better give us the final ruling. So there was a great rabbi called Rabbi Yitzchak Alfasi, who undertook, he rewrote the Talmud just from its halachic rulings. Took out all the questions and all the answers, just went straight through the Talmud, just giving the final conclusions for everything. Which was amazing, but not in terms of organization. Because as we know, one of the reasons why it's called Talmud Bavli, because Bavl means mixture or confusion, because it's all over the place. It's tangent after tangent after tangent, and it's impossible to find things. So it's not written, called Bavli because it was written in Bavli? It is, but the, we, we wouldn't just name it that. It's, okay. it's the Babylonian Talmud. But we also call it Bavli because it's a Chalant. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yushalmi is better organized? Uh, well, the Yushalmi is uh, um, less... All over the place. We're missing yeah. Most, yeah. a lot of it. We're missing much, much of the Yashan. But even what we do have is less, doesn't fly <coughs> into some random topics for pages and pages and pages not related to the subject. The Yashan also doesn't have the same levels of questions and answers. It's a totally different style. That was the gift that the Rif gave to the Jewish people. But it still made organization impossible. So came along the Rambam, and his brilliant mind in terms of organization, and said, forget the order of the Talmud, and he just wrote 14 volumes based on a system of topics. So, all laws of damages, and even within laws of damages, subcategories and sub-subcategories, and took the entire Talmud and rearranged it just in the halachic rulings. Now, besides for the reorganization, he also differs with the Rif in many areas where the Rif gave rulings and things like that. But the point is that he organized it into 14 volumes, 83 categories, and hundreds and hundreds of subcategories that you could really find anything. Is it heretical to suggest that the minds of people were influenced by the people they lived with, so that, in, that the Greek mind had much more, uh, topoi is a Greek word topic, so much more a sense of organization. So the original Talmud, the people didn't need that because their minds were, a Jewish mind is well, <laughs> yes, sort of. <laughs> kind of, kind of. What I, what I would, I, I would say it absolutely a little differently, uh, but saying the same thing is that it used to be that people were much better connected with associations. So we don't remember things in our heads based on category and topic. We remember it by association. The best way that you can prove this is just stare out into the sky for an hour 
And whatever you're thinking about, stop and try to retrace your steps to where you started from. You'll never find it because our brains travel through association. So the Talmud actually uses association as the connectors because they had everything memorized. It wasn't written. But when you are doing the written word, now you're turning pages, we actually have lost the ability to memorize things because everything's indexed. We have stopped the ability of remembering things because we rely on Google. It used to be people remembered phone numbers. Today, nobody remembers phone numbers. I press the person's name. So I, I just don't use that part of my brain to, to, to remember that way. So then, yeah, you need to adjust the organization. After that came the rush. The Rosh, Rabbeinu Asher, he used the Rifts system, ignoring the Rambam, but he rewrote the Talmud also in halachic ruling, but he just did it because he differs with the Rosh, with the Rif, in terms of the ruling. This brings us back to, I know I'm off the topic, but this is fascinating stuff, association, association yeah. Um, but the Rosh had a son called Rabbeinu Yaakov. Rabbeinu Yaakov felt that we need a much easier system to use. So he broke, he did very much like the Rambam, but broke, uh, creating his own organization, but broke it into four categories. Orachaim, which is daily stuff. That includes davening, brachos, um, Shabbos, Yom Tov, Rosh Chodesh, etc. That's Orachaim, the way of life. Then Yoridea, which is, um, you know, Kashrus and uh, uh, the laws of uh, family purity and uh, of uh, uh, tithing and tzedakah and honoring parents. So those sort of general halachic issues. Followed by Choshen Mishpat, which is the laws of monetary law. And uh, Evan Ezer, which is rules of uh, marriage and divorce. And what's interesting is that he sort of broke it up into category one, things that everyone needs to know. Category two, things that everyone needs to know mostly about, but you need to ask a rabbi to get real um, decisions. Category three, things you have to go to a base dim for. And category four, that basically, don't worry about it, let the rabbis handle that which is a different way of organizing things, because he found himself in a society where people weren't able to do like they could in the Rambam, which is to study the whole Torah. And he called this um, system Arba Turim, Four Pillars. The Beis Yosef, Rabbi Yosef Cairo, came along a short while later and wrote a commentary on the tour, on the Arba Turim, which became so popular because this, in this commentary, he basically says, well, the Torah says this, but let me tell you, let me fill you in on why the Torah says this and who disagrees with him and who else says what. And basically, it's this huge, many, many times greater than the Rif, than the Torah. And basically, he was hoping that people would see the Torah and then around it, they would look at his commentary and see what else there is to know on the subject. The problem is, people just want to know, so tell me what to do. So he wrote a shortened version of that book, of the Beis Yosef, which just gives you his halachic decisions, called the Shulchan Aruch. That's the Shulchan Aruch we have today, is Rabbi Yosef Cairo with the glosses and comments by Moshe Israelis, the Ramah, who brought in the Ashkenazi really Anyway, but back to the tour. The tour wrote the four pillars, um, uh, the, this halachic system, where he divided into four categories. Besides that, he wrote another book, which is his commentary on the Torah. In his spare time. Yeah, in his spare time. Uh, in the commentary to the Torah, he makes use of, at least there's two versions of the Torah, but the Balaturim that we have, it's basically all gematrias. Remazim, hints, allusions. There's very little actual commentary. He just uses numerical values of things to explain things. And the fact that he comes up with some of these, and we'll see, we'll see one example of this, and that's why I'm, I'm building this up so that we can appreciate this. The Bal Haturim named his work on the Torah, 
he called his work on the Torah Baal Haturim, the one who wrote that other book. That's basically the name of, of this, his commentary on the Torah, which uses gematrias. He called it Baal Haturim, as if to say, I'm the guy who wrote that other great work on halacha with the whole new system. So everyone explains why would he name his, his one book as the book written by the guy who wrote the other book. And this is where I'll take a few moments to just explain. You see, you can't derive anything from gematria. Someone once came to the big rabbis, one of the big rabbis in, in Israel, and said to him, is there any significance to the fact that a certain president-elect, we won't mention his name, his, his name is the same numerical value as Mashiach ben David. Really? Yeah, his name is the same numerical value as Mashiach ben David. So they came to this big Mukubal in Israel, and they said to him, is there any significance to the fact that the president-elect's name is the same numerical value as Mashiach ben David? And he smiled and said, his name is also the same numerical value as Chatsi Mana Falafel. Falafel? <laughs> yeah, a half portion of Falafel. Chatsi Mana Falafel. Now, he can't, on the spot, and you know, check the numbers, it is. His name is the exact numerical value of Chatsi Mana Falafel. So what does that tell you? That you can't use only gematria. And say, well, if the Gamachi, if you've got other reasons to suggest that maybe he's some apocalyptic figure, then you can use that. Then you can use the Gamatria to sort of add to or to bolster or support the something you already know. But you can't walk around saying these two things are in the same numerical value, therefore they're equal to each other. <laughs> okay. So therefore. He named his sefer on the Torah Baal Haturim, as if to say, don't just, don't think that I'm just here sitting there th juggling things up and whatever's <laughs> the same numerical value gets connected. I'm also the guy who understands the significance of a system of organization, of basis of proofs. Take a look at my other work, Baal Haturim. And when you write a work like the Baal Haturim, then you can, like the tour, then you can come back and use gematrias to explain things. On that note, the yes, it's very funny that he wrote this Balaturim, and then um, Yosef Cairo came and and expanded it almost to bring you back to the Gemara. You know, it's like he took it from the Gemara, he shortened it, and only to bring it back to right. be more like a Gemara. Right. Than Absolutely, and that's that's actually the way it keeps going. It keeps getting smaller and then growing huge and then being shut down and then like like over the next three, four hundred years, the, the Shulchan Aruch was a small one-volume book. Mm -hmm. And then all these comments, today it's, it's a ten-volume set, they're, they're redoing it now, so it's a 30, 40 volume set, because they've got all these new commentaries. And so what we're stuck, how are we supposed to learn Hechel Shabbos from, from 30 books? So it comes along, someone like Rabbi Yeshua Neuwirth, and does the Shemir Shabbos Kel Chasa which is one volume of Shabbos, which now is, you can get in the three volume expanded edition. <laughs> and that's, that's, what, <laughs> that's what keeps happening. The whole point was to shorten it up, right? You can buy a Kitzur Shulchan Aruch today that's multiple volumes. It's called the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch. Right? It's just okay. we can't stand to have Yeah, because you see the tour the just, yeah, we're off the topic, but uh, I'll go with it anyway. The Rambam, the Rambam, when he wrote his book, one of the biggest issues was because he reorganized it. You couldn't trace back to where in the Talmud he got this halacha, and therefore he couldn't verify. Because the riff, you just follow along, and he's getting it from here. So at one point, someone once came to the Rambam and said to the Rambam, you know, I, this was a halacha in terms of the laws of, of going into exile for someone who kills accidentally going to the city of refuge. So he, he came to the Rambam and said, you have this law in these laws, and I checked through the two tractates in the Talmud that discuss this, Sanhedrin and Makos, and neither of them has this halacha. I don't know where you got it from. And the Rambam says, no, it's somewhere in there. It's somewhere in there. It's somewhere in there. And they sat down, the Rambam and this rabbi, and they learned through all of Sanhedrin and Makos. It wasn't there. It wasn't there. It was it in some other... So the story, the, the way the legend is told, is that the Rambam made a promise at that point that he would write another volume to give all the sources for everything he had done. And uh, the Rambam never ended up doing it, but the legend is that about 
Ten minutes after the man left, the Rambam remembered there's a Gemara in Yevamos that discusses that's the only place in the rest of the Talmud that, the, that has a unique law on the, in this subject outside of those two tractates. And he remembered it and chased after the guy, and he did catch him, he didn't catch him, you know, stuff of legends. But the point is the Rambam, the Rambam passed away without having done it even though he says that he would, and so other rabbis said, well, then we'll do it for you. So now we have the Magid Mishnah, who wrote a whole book, and, and now that's one of the commentaries inside the Rambam. In each line in the Rambam, he says, this is the Rambam source, and this is where he gets it from, and this is, uh, this is how he read the Gemara in order to get to this conclusion. Says Rabbi Yosef Cairo in his spare time, you got them all wrong, you got all the sources. So he wrote another book called Kesev Mishnah, and then the Lechem Mishnah and the Mishnah Lamalach. Now the Rambam is, has uh, all these commentaries all disagreeing about what, how did the Rambam read the Gemara, what did he mean, because uh, this, is, this is the way that we, we teach Torah. Okay, so back to the tour. So the Balaturim says that the three words, Olim v'yordim bo, not as we would spell it, but as they're spelled in the Torah, because the word yordim is without a vav, is the numerical value of 928. You can count this yourself. Olim v'yordimbo is 928, which is the exact numerical value of, and I quote, Bavel umadai yavan v'romi. Babylon and Media, Greece and Rome. Also, 928. Check it out yourself. And... It has to be that way. Olim v'yordim bo, which the Pirkei der Blaza reads is referring to Babylon and Media and Persia, and, I'm sorry, and Greece and Rome. Of course it's going to be the same numerical value because that's the way it has to be. But you couldn't have said that if you hadn't seen the Medrash first, which explains that Yaakov is being shown the future of the Jewish people. And it's interesting that now, uh, we're, we're, we're going to have to stop after the third level this week, meaning after Remez, without the Sod. No, no, that's the... Okay, but um, I, I think it's important to stress that generally this is the time of the year, it's right before Hanukkah, and we are into this recognition that the Jewish people travel through these exiles, the Greek exile being one of them, and it's foretold. There's a prophecy that there's going to be um, these four exiles, Greece being one of them, and it's, it says here that the, you know, he saw, he saw that they would last for 180 years, which is how long the Greek empire lasted. And that means that the story of the Jewish people is, in fact, a story of ascent and descent based on these angels and the control that they have over us. So we just want to, I don't have time for the whole thing, but just to take us one step, one line, into a deeper explanation, the way the Ramban and other commentaries take this from a philosophical perspective, is that the most important dream of all, I'm sorry, the most important part of Yaakov's dream is the line that nobody focuses on, which is, Vihine Hashem Nitzav Alav. That whatever your dreams are, whether it's the altar or Sinai or the exiles, Whatever, however you're understanding it, if it's the temple or prayers or whichever these angels are, Israeli angels, God is in charge of it all. And the message that's being sent to Yaakov is fear not. You're running from Esau. You're running to a place where you are in danger. Your whole story is going to be the Jewish people traveling through Babylon. They go up and down, and we're still here. Traveling through Persia, they go up and down, and we're still here. And Greece and Rome as well, it's been thousands of years. And we are still here because the message of the dream is Vinei Hashem Nitzav Alav. So the first time that a Jew goes into real exile, running from those enemies <coughs> who would want to destroy them, and Yaakov runs from one enemy who wants to kill him into the hands of another enemy of whom we say... He wanted to destroy them all, only to be led to another thing, to go down into Egypt. 
The key to remember the message of this dream, V'yinei Hashem Nitzav Alav, Hashem always protects us, may it be so, may we see the redemption when finally the world will come to a place where um, everyone will see that God is in charge and not the other powers. Thank you.